don't know if you've ever read the story of Joseph uh, in the Bible, but if you haven't, if you've never studied his life, uh, do yourself a favor and begin that journey like immediately. Not while I'm talking, but <laughs> soon thereafter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually talk about him a little bit today. And so find your place in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Uh, if you're new to church or God or the Bible, um, that's toward the back uh, portion of your Bible. If you have a table of contents, uh, you can look in that. There should be a Bible maybe in front of you if you're in the seat backs here. Uh, if you're at Lockport and you don't have a Bible, there probably is somebody that could, you could look on with or maybe just identify yourself to one of the ushers. They'd be glad to try and get you a Bible over there. Um, or if you're in the East Worship Center, uh, there's some probably around on the tables. If not, an usher would be glad to get you one. Um, but just look at the table of contents. Hebrews is uh, most of the way toward the back. So if you just go to the last book, Revelation, and just start heading left, you'll run into Hebrews soon enough, all right? Hebrews chapter 11 is where we're going to be in just a few moments, and we're going to pick up uh, on some themes there. If you know anything about Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the whole chapter is talking about faith. And we're talking about now some stories of faith, and I wanted to communicate with you a little bit about Joseph. I mean, what a life, right? If you've studied his life at all, there is so much to learn about God and so much to learn about faith. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm sometimes stunned by his patient, relentless, resilient faith. I mean, this is a guy who was dreaming incredible dreams when he was young, right? You remember that? You remember, some of you remember if you grew up in church at all and you hear these stories. Joseph had these incredible dreams, you know, and he got this really just fabulous coat, right, uh, from his dad. Uh, but he dreamed these great dreams that, you know, uh, people were going to bow down before him. I mean, who would, you know, if you dream that, would you actually tell anyone that dream? Joseph did. He, there was just kind of a, a no guile. He just kind of told them, here's what was going to happen. They were not at all happy because he had a bunch of brothers and they were very, very hot with Joseph. And so they end up, you know, with Joseph, they plot to kill him, right? His dad sends him out to go find where they are and then they plot to kill him. And, and then one of them steps in and says, no, don't kill him. You know, that's not gonna go. We don't want the blood on our hands. And so they basically, you know, fake his death or stage his death and, you know, take this bloody robe back to, um, to the dad. And, uh, you know, and then Jacob's all beside himself because the son that he loves so much is now dead. And, and then they basically, you know, they, they, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites ended up selling him to the Egyptians. And so now Joseph finds himself in Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he gets, um, he's looked upon with favor because of who he is. And he gets, um, he's now working for Potiphar. Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's officials and kind of a, a big wig. And so he's working in Potiphar's house and he's got charge of the whole place. But then Potiphar's wife is like, this dude is hot. He is a stud, and I think that I want him for myself. She tries to lure him in. Joseph does not buy into the temptation. He, in fact, just runs away from it, but she goes ahead and falsely accuses him and says, he tried to rape me. Potiphar, of course, her husband, he's not happy about it at all, um, but then, and so ultimately, you know, he ends up going to jail, and while he's in jail, he meets some different people that are in jail, but one of them is the warden of the jail who ends up loving this guy, Joseph, and he promotes him in the jail, and now, like, Joseph's running the whole jail, and it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, and he runs into these two guys who used to work for Pharaoh. One's a cupbearer, one's a baker, and they're talking about, you know, they're having these crazy dreams, and then Joseph tells them what their dreams are all about, and they're like, what is going on? And one of them makes it out, one of them doesn't, he gets killed, and then uh, eventually uh, this cupbearer finally says, to Pharaoh when he's back with Pharaoh. He says, hey, guess what? I know you're having these crazy dreams. I remember there's somebody that comes to mind. I remember somebody who knows how to interpret these things. He goes and gets Joseph. Joseph gets out of jail. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh's like, I like you, I think, because you can tell me what all this trouble has been all about. I think I'm going to keep you around. Eventually, Joseph gets promoted uh, to where he is basically running Egypt. He's kind of the right-hand man for the Pharaoh. He's not even Egyptian. And he's now running the place in such a way that he eventually not only gets to save his own people, but he gets to save his people Israel because there was a coming famine of which he had planned masterfully for. And now he ultimately gets that as his, you know, as his kind of lot in life. He gets to save Israel after all of this stuff. I mean, you want to talk about an unbelievable, resilient, 
faith that just keeps on pressing through, Joseph is a perfect example. And there is so much that in our day and age we could learn from Joseph. But Joseph's just not inspirational for us in our day and age. The early church, which was you know a really long time after Joseph, the early church was greatly inspired by Joseph. In fact, the very first martyr of the faith, Stephen, was about to get killed, really, I'm, I mean, he may or may not have known that, but he was about to get killed for embracing Jesus and talking about the resurrected Christ, and he preached this absolutely unbelievable sermon in Acts chapter 7, and in it, he references Joseph and basically gives a summary of his life. Acts chapter 7, beginning of verse 9, he says, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles, and he gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our fathers could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was. And Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. And after this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all, then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our fathers died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. So you gotta remember this, that even in the early church, the story of Joseph was very integral to who they were as a people. It meant a significant amount. That legacy and story of faith meant so much to them, just like in our day and age, it means so much to us. So. His life has great significance, and when you look at the span of Joseph's life and all the stuff that he did and all that he went through, it's no wonder that Joseph shows up in what we would call in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. That Joseph's name shows up here, right? You, you, it's almost unbelievable, I'm not ready for that yet. It's almost unbelievable that he would show up in this context in Hebrews chapter number 11. But how he shows up is an unbelievable curiosity to me. Of all the things that you could choose to talk about in Joseph's life, his soap opera life, of everything you could choose to talk about, Hebrews wants to talk about something that I'm still scratching my head over occasionally. Chapter 11, verse 22, it says this. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. For real? That's what you're going to hand me? I mean, I could have picked from any phase in Joseph's soap opera life and talked about his faith in that regard. And what you give me is this. When he was about to kick the bucket, he said a word about Israel leaving Exodus and then told him what to do with his bones. Wow. Now, we might look at that for a second and go, why this? Why not something else? I mean, pick anything. Man, when he was in jail and falsely accused, are you kidding me? When he's in Egypt all alone by himself and what that took with his faith, are you kidding me? When his brothers betrayed him and left him for dead and lied to his dad and he had no way to really kind of make the situation right. That's what I would think I would want to hear about. But no, what we hear about in the hall of fame of faith is this. He gave some instructions about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt or talked about that and then gave some instructions about where to bury his bones. All right. So what do we do with that? Well, what we do with that is this, is that we realize is that there is some incredible, rich, substantive faith lessons in this for us if we'll just pay attention, but some context needs to come first, and then we'll get to what we can pull out of this, all right? Or some of you going, <laughs> I, I'm really just kind of... I just wanna see what you pull out of this thing, right? That's what I've been doing all week. I've been like, what am I pulling out of this thing? Hopefully, it's gonna mean something to you in terms of your substance of faith, but I, I wanna give you some context, all right? What's referenced here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22 is actually what we find in the very last words of the book of Genesis. Genesis is an incredible chronicle of the early patriarchs, Joseph being kind of the last one of those. And the very last words of the book of Genesis in chapter number 50, verses 24 through 26, say these words. Then Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110 and after they embalmed him, very Egyptian by the way, after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So what Joseph did when he was getting ready to die is he called to their remembrance the promise of God that had been given to his great-grandfather, Abraham, probably around 200 years prior. This promise to Abraham was made, and he made it to say this, Abraham, you are going to have a people, and Abraham, your people is going to actually possess a land of promise and it's going to be yours. You're not going to be oppressed anymore. You're going to have your own land. In Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, we see those words. It says this, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. In other words, here's the promise he makes. He says, uh, your people, Israel, that's coming from you, the people that I promised that would come out of you and Sarah, even though you're old and you're going to have this baby named Isaac, but, but out of you is going to come a people and this people is going to be enslaved in a country that's not their own, which we know now was Egypt. But he says, eventually, four generations, 400 plus years, you're going to be able to get out of there. And then you're going to go into a country of your own and you're going to possess it. This is what the promise is. So 200 years before Joseph, to his great grandfather, a promise was made. And the interesting thing is, is that Joseph believed it with all of his heart because Abraham had communicated it to Isaac and Isaac was the child of promise. So Isaac knew full well that there was a promise involved. And then Isaac communicated it to Jacob. And we know that Jacob knew this promise very well, who was Joseph's dad. Listen to Genesis chapter number 48, verse 21. Israel, which is Jacob's name, his name was changed to Israel. Then Israel said to Joseph, his son, I am about to die but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. So isn't it interesting? Promise is made to Joseph's great-grandfather. It is passed along to Isaac. It is passed along to Jacob. Jacob, when he's about to die, says, hey, here's what's gonna happen. The people are gonna come out of oppression. They are gonna come out of the hand of Egypt. And Jacob knew full well that they were under the oppression of Egypt because they were at the time of Jacob. And then what happens with Joseph? Joseph lives his soap opera life. Of course, you know, he sees all of this stuff, but Joseph's about to die. And what does Joseph do? Exactly what Jacob did. He says, there's a promise and I believe it. And it is a promise that God is going to make good on. And his faith is demonstrated in this. He, he believes so strongly. In fact, listen to this. Joseph believes so strongly in the promise that God has made that here's what he does. He says to Israel, the people of Israel, when he's about to die, I'm making you swear an oath that when you leave, and you will, you will leave this place. When you do, you bring my bones with you. And you bring them to my country. This is the faith of Joseph. In fact, that happens because when ultimately, long after Joseph, long after Joseph's descendants, a man named Moses is raised up in Israel while they are still in the midst of oppression. And guess what happens when the time of the Passover comes right as they're leaving? Listen to Exodus chapter 13. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle, but Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath and he had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. So Moses, when he led the people out, he carried out Joseph's bones from hundreds of years prior to that time. It's actually a really, really cool verse of scripture that when we look at in its beginning, kind of tucked away in this hall of fame of faith, we go, what in the world is this doing here? I could have chosen all of these 
particular episodes from the life of Joseph and been able to illustrate faith in a significant way. And what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22 says is, when his end got near, he spoke about the Exodus and he gave instructions concerning his bones. And as a result of that, the author thought that was so significant by the power of the Holy Spirit, he includes it among Hebrews chapter 11, talking about these incredible stories of faith. So here's the question that we've got to ask. What do we learn about the substance of faith from this verse? What do we learn? Jot that down. What do we learn about the substance of faith from this verse? Here's the first thing. That faith keeps our citizenship in the right place. All right? This is the first thing that I want you to understand about the substance of your faith. That faith keeps the, our citizenship in the right place. Think for a moment with me about Joseph, all right? I know you're jotting these things down, but hopefully you can multitask. Think with me for just a moment about Joseph. Joseph, listen to this, lived and died in Egypt. But hear me, but Joseph did not live and die as an Egyptian. He lived and died in Egypt, but he didn't live and die as an Egyptian. You see, Joseph's faith in the God of Israel, who is the only true God, set him off from everything else that was around him. It separated him from all of the pagan notions and pagan gods that the Egyptians worshiped, not least of which was the sun. And so when Joseph is giving this instruction that we see that his bones are to be brought to the promised land when he is buried in Egypt, this is not just a show of national solidarity, even though it is in part that. He's saying, I'm identifying with my people. I'm identifying with my people Israel. It's not just that, though. And it's not just that Joseph says, I want to be buried in my homeland. It's not that either. It seems like it's that because you go, okay, Joseph gets embalmed and he's buried in a coffin in Egypt and he's basically given instructions about his bones saying, hey, I want to get buried in my homeland. Well, I mean, yeah, that might be a little bit of a part of it, but that's not the major part of it. But even though that was somewhat significant to a lot of people. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Lonesome Dove or read the book Lonesome Dove. It was a miniseries. You may have heard of it. It's pretty famous. There were two actors in there that you're pretty familiar with, Tommy Lee Jones and Robert Duvall. Great actors. Um, two great ones in terms of uh, American acting, certainly over the last generation. It was an interesting story, right? Lonesome Dove, if you ever... How many of you ever heard it, seen it, anything, right? Okay, maybe half of you. Um, I won't chronicle the whole story for you, but let's just say this, that one of the guys, Gus, and one of the guys who was Woodrow McCall, but they called him Call, uh, which was played by Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Call was a little bit of a hard character. Gus was a little more of a kind of a lazy bones kind of dude, and they just decided they were going to make this trek. They were going to go on this incredible uh, journey out west to Montana and cattle rustle and do all of that kind of stuff. And Lonesome Dove was actually a town in Texas where they were from. And so they, they had this incredibly epic journey, you know, and they get out there, and eventually what happens is Gus gets shot by a poison arrow from uh, an Indian, and it eventually is, it, he knows it's going to kill him. It's looking bad. So Gus says to Call, hey, what I want, what I want to happen ultimately is I want you to bury me in Lonesome Dove. And it was all the way back, you know, they, they, it was a long way, you know, to get back there. And, uh, and Call agrees to do it, and Gus dies, and then there's kind of this epic journey to get him back and to bury him because he said, the only place I really ever found peace uh, was back in Lonesome Dove, Texas. And so he brings him all the way back. So there's some sentimental value, I understand, and we've seen it in kind of American literature and American uh, media and cinema. There's some inherent value of saying, I want to be buried back in my hometown. But that's not solely what was going on here with Joseph. Joseph's faith was not tied to the place in which he lived and he died, nor was it tied to the place in which he would be buried. His faith was actually in God, and he was thinking of things that were much bigger than just what he was experiencing. 
In fact, even though it's written just prior, uh, even though these verses come just prior to talking about Joseph, uh, the truth of these verses is also uh, very relevant to Joseph in Hebrews chapter 11. Look with me, verse 13. It says, all these people, and it's talking about Abraham and others who showed faith, and of course you could include Joseph. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return, but instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You see, this was true of Joseph. Joseph was not just about, hey, I want to identify with my people. Hey, I, I feel most comfortable being buried there. It wasn't just that. It was God is true and I believe him. I know that his promise is true and I want this to be a testimony to the fact that I believe in his promise. And I can't help but believe, ladies and gentlemen, that Joseph's faith, when he said, I believe the promise of God and even though I lived and died in Egypt, I did not live and die as an Egyptian, I think it inspired the one who would ultimately deliver Israel out of bondage named Moses. Because listen to what's said of Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. You see, Moses' faith was actually shaped by Joseph's faith because Joseph understood this. His faith keeps his citizenship in the right place. Joseph knew where he belonged. He knew to whom he belonged. It's, listen, here's the practical application for you. What faith will do for you is it will keep your citizenship in the right place. It will keep you detached from the things of this country, this world, that want to grab hold of you and lock you down and keep you strung up. You will understand that just because you have possessions does not turn you into a materialist. If you have faith in God, you recognize that what you have been given is given by God and it is for the glory of God and that you can leverage it for his use. That is what faith will do. It will keep your citizenship in the right place. Instead of being a citizen of this world, you will live in the midst of it, but you will be traveling a different road. Your citizenship is firmly fixed in your faith in God. It will mean that the way in which you treat the relationships you have, you will look at them in light of eternity as opposed to just looking at them in terms of what value you can try and suck out of them in the now. It may be that the people that you are trying to love will not love you back, and you may have to just go, guess what? If you never love me back, I will continue to love you because my faith is in God and my citizenship is there. And as a result, I won't be bound and chained by everything that has me in this life and in this world and only thinking about myself and my satisfaction. I realize I'm looking ahead to my reward. I realize that I'm being prepared for something else that's coming. I'm a part of a shadow government right now that is going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus and I am being prepared for what God wants me to do and I'm going to look at things through that lens. Faith makes sure that we understand where our citizenship is. That's what we learned from Joseph. But let me give you a second thing. Sometimes, here's what we learn. Sometimes we need to borrow someone else's faith. Sometimes we need to borrow someone else's faith. Now, this is so contrary to what you're probably thinking. You're, you're probably thinking, wait a minute. This is about my personal faith. Hold on a second. Do me a favor. Close your eyes for me. Would you do that for a second? Just close your eyes. Just indulge me here for a moment, wherever you are. Lockport, East Worship Center here. Indulge me for a moment. Close your eyes. I want you to imagine that you are in ancient Israel, ancient Egypt, actually, with the people of Israel. You have been longing to get released from the oppression of the Egyptians for so long. And you've heard stories that maybe God's doing that now. You've just witnessed some of the plagues that have gone through and now you've heard 
as you've watched the Passover where God, because of the blood that is on the doorposts, you've heard that there is a sense in which God is doing something very unique. You've heard that the Egyptians are losing their firstborn, but you are not. And now you get ready to leave because you've heard, hey, gather your belongings and ask the Egyptians for silver and gold and they'll give it to you. And they do. And you haven't even had time to put the leaven in your bread. It's unleavened. And you're taking all of that out and you're rushing out. And now you're going to finally and ultimately be leaving Egypt. And Moses was gathering everybody around, but you start looking around going, hey, where's Moses? Where's Moses? I don't see him anywhere. Where is he? And eventually he comes walking out and he's got a box with him. You say, what? Moses, what is that? And he looks at you and he says, they're Joseph's bones. Open your eyes for a second. Do you know how inspiring that would be? Do you know that Joseph's bones would actually be a reminder of the faith that he had in the promise that came so long ago when he said, this is gonna happen. I'm going to my grave believing it because God said it. And now Moses is seeing the fulfillment of Joseph's bones exiting Egypt and he's carrying them with him and all the people must be looking going, it is on. It is happening. This is going down. But it wasn't finally and completely fulfilled yet. Because Joseph said, I want my bones buried, right? So they get out. My imagination tells me this, that once they got out, there was a lot that happened. But ultimately, you and I both know that through the wilderness wanderings, do you know whose bones were hanging out with them during that time? Joseph's. I wonder if the kids... A generation that was born in the wilderness, the really the ones, the only ones that would make it out of the wilderness. I wonder if when they were younger, sometimes they would walk by and they would go, hey, mommy, hey, daddy, what's that box in the big caravan that leads us in the front? What is that? Sweetheart, those are Joseph's bones. What, well, tell me about Joseph. Joseph, hundreds of years ago, believe the promise that was given to his great-grandfather that we would be released from the Egyptians and that he said when you are because God said you will be when you are I want you to take my bones with you and I want you to bury them in the promised land that's how sure I am of what God said and the parents they may not have quite gotten it because they were doing a lot of belly aching and complaining and all that stuff and they weren't gonna make it out but those kids they had the opportunity to witness something. Listen, every time they see Joseph's bones, they, when they're struggling, when they're going, are we ever going to make it to the promised land? I don't think we're ever going to get there. I don't think anything's ever going to happen. You know what they could do? They could borrow Joseph's faith for just a moment just by looking at his bones and just saying, I got no reserves left here. I don't know that this is ever going to happen. I wonder if Moses did that. I wonder if Moses was ever just sitting around the tent sometimes just going... Are we, is, is, are we ever going to be able to get to this place called the promised land? Is this ever going to happen for us? And then guess what? He looks over at Joseph's bones and he's got no reserves in his faith tank, but he looks over and just goes, wow, I, I can borrow that faith for just a few moments. You know, what we do, ladies and gentlemen, is we borrow faith from one another. I don't know if you realize that. We borrow faith. It's, uh, this, it makes perfect sense, by the way, that Joseph in this passage is talked about in terms of his bones because the book of Hebrews is written to struggling people in their faith that are brand new to faith and they don't know what to do with themselves and they're really struggling and they're facing persecution. So it's no wonder that this appears in here. I mean, in our church, we've had people that have gone through some very tragic circumstances. And you know what I've seen over the course of time? either through tragic circumstances or great life difficulty. You know what I've watched through time? That now they've seen another, another group of people or another family in our church going through some very difficult times that are very similar to what they went through a couple of years ago, and they come alongside of them. You know what they do when they come alongside of them? These people are going, I got nothing. I didn't expect my child to die. I've got nothing. And what they say is, you can borrow our faith for a little while, 
Because we've seen that God is faithful. We've seen that God will walk us through. We've seen the grace of God in action. And you can borrow mine for a little bit. I'll lend it to you. I will be Joseph's bones for you for a few moments. That's what we have the opportunity to do. That is the substance of our faith sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes it shapes our citizenship, but at other times what we learn from this passage of Scripture is this, is that sometimes we have to borrow other people's faith in the body. That's why when we talk about faith, we don't talk about it just in an isolated way. It's not just about you and your person. It's not just about you. It's about the body that we're a part of. And sometimes we have to borrow one another's faith, right? It's important. I'm going to give you a breather for a second and let you listen to something. And then I'm going to come back and give you the third reminder. Take a listen. Take my hand Walk with me a while Cause it seems your smile Has left you Don't give in You fall apart And your broken heart Has failed you I said a lie Show you my love for this world to see. You can borrow mine when your hope is gone. Borrow mine when you can't go on. Cause the world will not defeat you when we're side by side. When your faith is hard. can borrow mine So take my love And all that you can see Is the raging sea
What a great reminder, isn't it? That's who we are as the body of Christ. That's a part of what we need to understand about faith, that faith isn't just about you being able to trust God to make it through. Sometimes faith is you being able to trust God and letting others who are having difficulty doing that in their season of life be able to draw from you so that you can be Joseph's bones to them and maybe inspire them and maybe your faith they can just borrow for a little while. It's a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. But let me, let me give you a last thing that I would say that I learned about the substance of faith from this little verse that we've got tucked away here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. It's this, that your faith counts because God can be counted on. Um, even when it seems like your trust in God seems like it's forever in materializing. Anybody ever been in one of those spots before? Where it just seemed like I, I've been trusting God and I've been trusting God and I've been trusting God and it feels like, yeah, what's the deal here? It seems like it's almost an impossible task, but you're trying to trust God. Think about this. The promise came to Abraham 200 years before Joseph. Joseph now is alive and Joseph lived for 110 years. And it would be a couple hundred more, plus 40 in the wilderness before that promise would ever be materialized, before it would actually ever happen. Isn't that astounding to think about? Before it would actually ever happen, hundreds of years in the process. But Joseph went to his grave saying this, I wanna tell you about the exodus that's coming. It's a long way off, but I wanna tell you about the one that's coming and when it does, I want you to bring my bones and I want you to bury them in the land of promise. That's how sure I am that God is gonna come through. Does it ever seem to you that, um, that God is painfully last minute? <laughs> Has anybody ever landed in that spot or ever experienced that, that God is just painfully last minute in what he does? Like he's, you almost wanna go, you're the 11th hour God. You're the 11, 59, and 59 second God, right? Just before the clock strikes midnight for my doom. But faith can, listen, faith counts because faith can be counted on. God can be counted on. Our faith in him, he can be counted on. No matter what his time economy looks like, he is always on time. Whether you think he's on time or not, he's always on time. And sometimes he feels like a last minute God. I can't imagine what it looks like when Abraham is given instruction about his son Isaac and he goes up on Mount Moriah and he ties his son down and he lifts the knife toward heaven to plunge into his son whom he is going to sacrifice and God shows up right then. I don't know what it feels like to be Israel crossing a dry bed of ground that was sea where the water is now stacked up on either side and they are trying to make it out on foot as best they can and they hear the rumbling of Egyptian chariots that are coming back to put them back in chains that at just the moment that they got out of the sea, the sea swallows them, God shows up at the last minute. I don't know what it would be like to be the disciples who are on a boat where Jesus is sleeping and there is a storm that is raging and the waves are crashing over the boat and they are about to drown and just at the last moment, Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. I don't, want to, I don't know what it's like to be Peter who is sitting in a jail cell, who has been captured by Herod. Herod has already put to death John the Baptist, and now he's got Peter in chains, chained to two guards in between them, and in the very morning, the next morning, he is gonna be brought out for a public trial where he is gonna go ahead and be killed, and an angel shows up and breaks the shackles and walks him free just at the last moment. Sometimes our God shows himself in the scripture, right, as the last minute God, as the 11th hour God. And listen, here's the thing, God can be counted on. Sometimes he is gonna show up at the last hour, listen to this, and sometimes he's not. Promise was made to Abraham, Abraham did not see it. 
The promise was made to Isaac. Isaac did not see it in his life. They saw it. They just didn't see it in their lifetime. Promise was made to Jacob. Jacob did not see it. Promise was made to Joseph. Joseph did not see it. But God could be counted on even when you cannot see it. He still comes through. He still does what he says he will do. That's what, in fact, I've got to, I, I, just, I have to tell you this. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32, you see both sets. You see those where God came through at the last hour, so to speak, and where he didn't. Listen to what verse 32 says in chapter 11. It says, what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others, listen to this, were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, here's what, we, here's what I learned from Joseph. God can be counted on even in death. You see, so oftentimes our faith gets shaken because the things that we look at and we just say to ourselves, man, what's the deal, God? My husband or my wife that died, they loved you and they were serving you. Why'd they have to die? Why, God, my kids? Why? They're just children with an innocent love for you. Why my mom and dad who, who loved you so much? Why? Why would they have to die? I need to pause you here and remind you of something that God can be counted on. And what God has revealed in the person of Jesus Christ who suffered in our place and went to a cruel cross to bear the sin of the world, who died a thief's death, who got up from the dead. Listen to this. His resurrection is a promise. It is a promise that you have not been forgotten in Christ. It is a promise that he is going to come again for his own and that you, like him, will be resurrected. This is what it means. This is what it means. One day when Jesus returns, he is going to take your bones and he is going to bring them finally home forever. This is the promise. This is what we count on. My bones is what I, listen, my bones are going with him because the exodus from this world is a fact in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I will be freed one day and my bones will not remain in Egypt. They will be resurrected to live in a country that is my own finally and forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, this little verse tucked away in this place, it's got a lot to tell us, doesn't it? So here's the deal. You need to make sure that your faith is in the right person, Jesus. Because when it is, your citizenship finds its right place. You don't seek first this world, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when you do that in this journey, you don't do it alone. You do it with other brothers and sisters. And I'm looking around in this room seeing people who are sitting next to one another who I know, I know their stories, and I know that they've let one another borrow faith. They've shared their faith walking through a difficult time with somebody standing next to them. Sometimes you're going to have to do that. And then I want to remind you that I don't care what time it is. Maybe your situation's impossible. Know this. Maybe God wants to show up at the last minute. Or maybe he won't. But either way, he can be counted on. Because there's coming a day when he returns. And the resurrection of the righteous, our bones are going to go home. Bow your heads with me. Before we leave, I want to say this to you. Faith teaches us everything. And without faith, we cannot please God. 
And if you've never before put your faith and trust in Jesus, then if you're at the Lockport campus, Pastor Jonathan's gonna give you instruction about what we want you to do. If you're in the East Worship Center or here in the Main Worship Center, come by the fireside room, let, let one of our pastors or prayer partners talk to you about what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For the remainder of us, I would say this to you. I hope you'll ask the question, who do I need to be Joseph's bones to this week? Somebody may need to borrow my faith or maybe I need to borrow someone's, right? Maybe I need to concentrate on what God has promised and if God chooses to intervene right here in the midst of my situation, I'm gonna trust him and I'm gonna love him because he's good and if he chooses not to, I know that at the end of the day what he's promised is he's coming for me and my bones won't live in Egypt forever. I'm going to a country of my own where I belong. Father, what a precious reminder about faith today. Thanks for Joseph's life. Thanks that in his death, his bones speak a word to us. They inspired me this week. May you help us to be Joseph's bones to people. That we would all keep our eyes fixed on you. I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.